At the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, we bring together physicians and investigators from the University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, and we work closely together, collaborate on primarily coming up with important research questions that we can then take forward to improve caring for patients, not only at our center, but ideally across the country and across the world. And I think for a disease like acute lymphoblastic leukemia that's so much more common in children, uh, there may not be a better example in our system where we really, all three of those different institutions really work together to try to improve the treatment. The title, roughly, is looking at the time that patients take to become minimal residual disease negative in the course of receiving a chemotherapy regimen called hyper-CVAD for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We've known for several years that that's a very important uh, factor to determine which patients are going to do well and which patients are not likely to do so well. Um, however, that's never really been looked at in any kind of systematic way for this chemotherapy regimen called hyper-CVAD, which is one of the more common chemotherapy regimens used for adults in the United States, uh, including at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So what my colleagues and I wanted to do was look back at our institution's experience to try to get a sense of how important is that level of response, not only how deep they get, but also the time at which it occurs to see if that can help us determine which patients are gonna be at greatest risk of, of recurrence or relapse versus those that are at lower risk of relapse. It's widely known in the ALL community that this is a really important uh, tool to use. Furthermore, there's uh, a lot of excitement about newer tools that are being developed that can detect very, very small amounts of leukemia that may prove to be even more important. Um, so because the hyper-CVAD regimen is used so commonly, but investigators hadn't really looked at this specific question before, um, our hope is that it will provide some useful information not only for us as clinical researchers thinking about how, how we can use this potentially to guide what kind of studies we would do in the future, but also as physicians counseling our patients that are receiving this regimen, if we see this kind of response at this certain time point, that might suggest there's a pretty good chance that a patient's gonna stay in remission long term versus those that are maybe not so likely to stay in remission. Those might be the patients best served by being referred for a stem cell transplant while they're in remission. We took a slightly different approach based on how our patients uh, at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance were monitored um, to really kind of get a sense over a, over a period of times. Um, so I think um, these data are gonna prove to be fairly useful, um, not just in my practice, but hopefully in other, other patients or other physicians' practices as well to try to, again, hopefully do a better job of identifying those patients that are really likely to do very well with the treatment they're getting and that we should stay the course versus those not so likely to do well where maybe we need to pivot to something else. The other thing that I think this uh, points out is um, actually looking for that very early response fairly early in the course of treatment I think is important. So doing a bone marrow examination after the first or second cycle of, of treatment to really get a sense at that early time point what kind of response a patient has had I think is a very useful tool. And that may not be something that's done that routinely. The rest of us in the academic community that are doing research, I think it provides even that much more strength behind the conclusions.